just outside Fort Collins, Colorado, on his way home from a friend's house. We believe that on August 26, 1989, a vehicle was traveling uh, southbound on US 287 when it crossed the center line and left the roadway. The impact was severe enough that the fuel line was fractured and the vehicle caught on fire. Heading north on his way to deliver a shipment of new semi-truck cabs was Werner Kerr. I saw a glow off to the uh, east side of the road. I thought it was probably a weed fire or, or something minor because I figured it was some major people would have stopped and cars kept coming at me and I didn't see any anybody stop. I got closer to it and I saw it was a truck. Two other men who happened to be driving by stopped to help Werner check out the burning pickup truck. What do you think's going on back there? I have no idea. I said, we better go back and take a look and make sure nobody's trapped in the vehicle. There was a driver pinned in the vehicle. There's a guy trapped in here. The steering wheel was pushed against him. He was be pinned between the steering wheel and the seat, and the door was jammed on that side. Let's get the fire out if we can. I knew at that time there was no way to get the driver out of the vehicle. Knowing there was no water, we just shoveled dirt with our hands to try to snuff out the fire. A passing motorist was sent to call for help. It wasn't affecting the fire at all. As a matter of fact, it grew in intensity. I had a real helpless feeling. Other motorists stopped, but stayed back because they thought the burning truck might explode. We got a shovel and bucket! I'll get it. Go for it. I got really worried because I saw that the fire started to come out from underneath the dash. There's fire in the cab! Werner abandoned his attempts to put out the engine fire and concentrated on the interior. After 14 years with the fire service, he was experienced in fighting fires. I've never seen a fire that's been as stubborn as, as this fire was. Nine one one. what is your emergency? At 12.38 a.m., a call reporting the accident came into the Fort Collins Police Department. <laughs> Rescue units were immediately sent to the scene, including Larimer County Sheriff's Deputy Ed Brunin. You do not go to very many accident scenes where you have a vehicle fire. You know, I think probably three times in 17 years have I seen, you know, have I seen a vehicle catch on fire. There was no way for us to get the fire out, and the only thing we could do is shield them from the fire. His leg is catching on fire. Here. It really starts bothering you because here you have somebody that's in, in terrible pain and you're trying everything you can to help them uh, to ease that pain and, and your, your hands are tied. When we continue. And to watch somebody burn inside a truck is not a very pretty sight and uh, definitely didn't want to give up on him. When a pickup truck crashed in an isolated area of the mountains, the unconscious driver was trapped inside the burning wreckage. Without any equipment, Werner Kern and another passing motorist were desperately trying to fight the fuel-fed blaze. You guys get out of there, it's gonna blow! People were yelling down to us at that point, you've done everything you can, let them go. I yelled to the people, I said, why don't you people come down here and help us? But uh, we never had anybody came down and helped us out. All the people had stopped. Nobody wanted to get involved. 
the weather. We weren't gaining on the fire, but we gained on protecting the driver. Okay, get some more. Uh, it extinguished the flames that were on him and uh, basically cocooned him in, in mud. There was an explosion, uh, a fireball, and it, it knocked me back. I couldn't understand why we were having uh, an explosion out of the cab itself. Bring it in! What they didn't know was there was a case of fireworks inside the truck. But I just got up and I went right back to what I was doing because uh, to watch somebody burn inside a truck is not a very pretty sight and, and uh, definitely didn't want to give up on him. Within six minutes of the call, Deputy Brunen arrived on the scene. Okay! Give me through! I felt a little inadequate. The fire extinguisher that are issued in our patrol cars are not designed to put out a, a vehicle that's being consumed by flame. So the best I could do was just try to maintain the, uh, the barrier between the uh, driver and the fire. It was uh, such an intense moment. Even knowing that the fire authority wasn't very far away, I could tell by the way the guy was breathing, he was in really bad shape. I didn't think that he would make it through the whole ordeal. The Poudre Fire Authority arrived to put out the blaze, led by firefighter EMT Ray Gillen. At that point, I didn't think that the victim was alive. I could see uh, no movement or um, anything with the victim at all. I reached over and felt the victim's arm and he had a pulse and then I, I seen some grasping for air. So at that point I took off my Scott pack and mask and put it on the victim because uh, I was out in the clear air and he wasn't. He was fighting for each breath that he took. It looked like he had a sense of wanting to live versus giving up, which a lot of people I've seen give up. I can just look at the inside of him, and t you know, the car and the mechanism, everything, saying this guy's got some major injuries. Paramedic Chris Cottonstead took over the victim's care. If he doesn't have lung injuries, he's got, you know, abdomen or gut injuries, you know, he may have a broken back or other problems. I mean, this guy was serious. He had a radio pulse. He wasn't down to the point where he, his heart wasn't beating yet. But I knew that if I didn't get stuff taken care of, that it would be shortly. Ray Gillen managed to crawl inside the truck to help stabilize the victim. I can't see him. Can you see his legs, Ray? No, I can't. Buried in dirt, mostly. Where'd he get all this mud from? I was curious why he was like that. And then I found out that it was because they were trying to put the fire out with the uh, mud. I was amazed to have the ingenuity to, to bury a guy with dirt to keep the fire off of him and to put that, put that barrier between the victim and the fire was excellent. Paramedic Jim Knoll also responded to the accident scene. We started with the, the roof, basically just taking it from around this patient piece by piece by piece until we could finally get him out. It's just such a difficult extrication. It seemed like every time a piece was taken away, you found that he was tangled up some other way. All right, let's go to hose. Our line's looking. After an hour, the victim was finally freed from the wreckage. It was incredible to see this man and to think that he was still alive after everything he had been through and all the work that we had been doing to get him out of there and he was still alive. But none of us on scene thought that, th that uh, the victim was going to be alive to see tomorrow. Ten-year-old Darrell Slipka was in such critical condition that he was taken to Denver University Hospital 60 miles away. He 
He was treated by Dr. Charles Hartford. His injuries consisted of a head injury with a skull fracture, fractures of his face and jaw, a chest injury, a fracture of his lower spine. He had a fracture of the pelvis, and he had burns which were quite deep of the right lower extremity and burns of the right arm and right chest, adjacent chest. Go ahead and switch the O2 out. Go ahead and get him. His parents, Lynn and Wayne, rushed to the hospital as soon as they were notified of the accident. Our son was involved in the accident. Can you tell us where he's at? Yeah, he's still in the upper room right now. He was my youngest son, and I couldn't, wouldn't even dream of living without him. Excuse me, miss. Do you know anything about Daryl Sunkow? The one nurse I talked to, she said, I'm sorry. She said, he is so bad. She said, he is so critical. She said, I don't think he'll last 24 hours. I felt my whole chest just break and bleed. Daryl was deep in a coma. When I did see him, I just kept saying over and over, Daryl, please, please, you can't leave us. A lot of our activity, Lynn's and mine, when we were there at the hospital with Daryl, was a, a, a hands-on kind of a thing. We were a, a kind of a touchy family, and we kidded him, even though he was uh, still unconscious, that when he got out, that he would owe us uh, a lot of back rubs and a lot of neck rubs. For six weeks, Daryl remained in the coma with no sign of improvement. One morning I walked in and talked loudly to him, actually shouted, and he opened his eyes. I think I was one of the happiest moms in the whole wide world. I cried, I sobbed, I kissed. I knew he was back with us. I know he knew who we were, and I knew there wasn't any brain damage. Daryl's right leg had been so badly burned that doctors were forced to amputate it. The people around the hospital, the doctors, the nurses, they just all got behind me and supported me and says, you know, it's not so bad, you know. People complain because they have no Reebok until they meet the guy where that has no feet. Could have been worse, you know, I could have been dead. And uh, last time I was there, Gene told me, Daryl and I have always been very, very close. But I didn't give Daryl as much credit as I do now. He's never had to fight for anything. But fighting for his life has made him, I think, um, a bigger and better person. I don't believe that I thought he had as much guts as he's really demonstrated that he has. After months of physical therapy, Daryl Slipka is getting on with his life. Just to live was nothing, you know. I wanted to be able to get back to where I was and even do more things than I used to do. It won't occur and save my life. I mean, which is something you cannot put a price on. You cannot repay anybody for that. The guy's phenomenal. I mean, this world should have more people like him. What I did was easy. Um, it only took an hour. What uh, Daryl has done has taken over a year. The real hero of this story is Daryl. 